Okay, our first speaker is Brad Jessup. He's a fuels uh, and natural resource specialist with the BLM here in Utah. Brad uh, is um, in the West Desert District in Utah. His focus is on designing and implementing vegetation treatments that reduce hazardous fuels, promote ecosystem resilience, and restore sagebrush habitat. Brad was a research associate uh, in the Plant and Wildlife Sciences Department of Brigham Young University where he managed the Sage Step Woodland Research Sites in Utah. So, Brad, take it away. Thanks, Paul. So I'm going to focus today on, on uh, BLM's approach to managing uh, sagebrush, especially in light of the recent uh, decision about the sage grouse and, and the importance of, and the emphasis on sage grouse habitat and in the state. So for those of you not familiar with BLM, um, there's multiple field, office th field offices throughout the state of Utah. I'm based out of Salt Lake, as you can see on the map here. It covers a very large area. We manage about 3.2 million acres of public land. And as far as priorities for sagebrush conservation, um, <coughs> See if I can figure out this pointer here. So, yeah, got it. Um, the very northwest corner is West Box Elder. And th these areas, not coincidentally, coincide with where the sage grouse populations are, uh, at least within our district. Um, so, West Box Elder is our major focus area. It was identified through the fiat, fiat process that Mike Pellant talked about earlier as one of the uh, uh, national priorities for sagebrush conservation. We also will be do a, a quite a bit of work in Rich County as well as in the central part of Tooele County around the greater Sheep Rock Mountains and then to a lesser st extent work out in the Ibapah area. Um, the primary threats to sagebrush habitat have been and continue to be fire, uh, conifer invasion, and invasive species. And I'm going to focus uh, the majority of my talk on conifer invasion and fire. Uh, Mike did a good job of talking about the invasive species side of things. So what's the national direction now that we've been given in managing these lands? Mike talked a little bit about the secretarial order, uh, the re recent record of decision. Um, and I also want to bring in, into light some of the approved resource management plan amendments, uh, management actions. And the, the intent from my perspective of these documents is it's really kind of our marching orders as we move forward to, in managing sagebrush uh, in relation to sage grouse. And these, these guidelines, um, well, this, this direction provides guidelines for coordination, prioritization of treatment areas, um, treatment types and design, where we put them on the landscape, habitat objectives and monitoring, plus a, a few others. So just a couple of highlights from the secretarial order to give you a feel for, for what that does to our fuels program and the way we do vegetation management. Um, the first one, expand the focus on fuels reduction opportunities uh, and implementation. So in a way that contributes to sage grouse habitat conservation and restoration. The next one, fully integrate the emergence, emergent, emerging science of ecological resiliency. So we're doing that at a, at a landscape scale. Um, and it's good to see that coming down from the national level uh, to, the, to the field. Uh, the last one, implement large-scale experimental activities to remove cheatgrass and other invasive annuals through various tools. So just some examples from the secretarial order about how specific they are and focused at, at what we are going to do on the ground. Some of the management actions that we pull out of the, um, the resource management plan amendments are, are listed up above. And, and again, these are... What I see is marching orders and guidelines and how we move forward in, in, in implementing these treatments. But they're very specific about defining desired conditions. What, what's the desired outcomes for these? For example, very specific about the amount of cover, sagebrush cover, perennial grass cover, uh, composition and things like that. Those gives us clear defined objectives that we're going to be shooting for as we implement these kind of treatments. Uh, the second one, management action, veg number one, treat areas to maintain and expand healthy greater sage grass habitat. Number two, remove conifers encroaching into sagebrush, but prioritize these treatments based on their proximity to lex. Uh, number f fire number three, use green strips and fuel breaks to protect greater sage grouse habitat. All these things kind of overlap and come together, 
come together to give us a big picture of how we manage these things on the landscape in association with fire. And then there are specific required design features as we implement these kinds of treatments. And, and just an example of one on the bottom is, is developing maps for greater sage-grouse habitat uh, by displaying existing fuels treatments that can be used by suppression forces. We send guys out to fight fire, but they don't necessarily know where all the fuel treatments are and how to tie into them when they're doing those things. So this is very comprehensive, trying to pull it all together so that we're all on the same page. To boil it down, um, my marching orders, the way I see them, is we're to protect and preserve sagebrush habitat. And we do that by eliminating the stressors to the system. Um, Strategic placement of green strips is one way to do it, providing fuel breaks on the landscape with the goal to minimize fire size and fire, fire severity by decreasing the fuel loading. The overarching goal of all of this is to alter the fire behavior and try to just minimize that impact of fire. The other component that I see is, is, uh, is the restoration side of thing, and it's really heavily based on the concept of ecological resiliency. When you think about resiliency, it, it, you it's a proactive way to, to manage land. Um, it shifts the focus from the trees to the understory, what's going to happen um, when the fire does come through. And uh, from my perspective, it's really based on this concept of that restoration should occur before the fire. And these kind of things are, are what we've incorporated into our fuels program over the last several years. And the secretarial order and the recent direction nationally really just emphasizes and helps to, to validify and focus uh, more, more fully what we're already doing on the ground. So the tools of the trade for, sorry, um, that I'm going to focus on today, so kind of got our vision where we're heading with this, how do we then accomplish this on the landscape. And I wanted to focus on two primary means today, uh, the first being prescribed fire and the other being mastication or mechanical shredding, and primarily within juniper systems. So prescribed burning. Um, within the West Desert District, we have a lot of low elevation, warmer sites that are fairly susceptible to cheek grass invasion. So we use prescribed fire very cautiously, and it's typically not used on the landscape scale. Uh, it's more intended for small, smaller scale projects. There are some advantages to prescribed burning. Uh, it's perceived, it is more natural as far as treatment longevity. Once you burn something, you've really reduced the fuel load for a fairly long period of time, especially when you're talking about sagebrush or juniper, and you get a nutrient pulse into the system. Prescribed fire can be a challenge to implement, though, um, and some of the disadvantages or challenges are you do have that risk of invasive species afterwards. Uh, you're not able to preserve the shrub component as readily as you would with mechanical treatments. Um, there are negative impacts to soil crust. There's a risk element associated with liability as a land manager when you light that match. And we also have to work around these fairly narrow uh, windows that are dependent on air quality and weather, and that can be a real challenge at times. And they're not that easy to implement, really. Uh, it takes a lot of preparation to do burn plans and really bring it together. So prescribed fire is a useful tool, but there are definitely some challenges associated with it. This is an example of a burn we did back in 2006, a broadcast burn, where we did try to go more at a landscape scale, about a thousand acres of juniper burning. And you can see around the perimeter that was the, the black line that we did the first day. We had a great window. The second day, um, conditions changed. We had a hella torch up trying to get things to go, and it was just a real challenge to get the results we wanted. All in all, um, of the 1,000 acres targeted for burning, we got about 30% of it burned. Um, so you have to learn to live with some of those results when you're doing prescribed fire. The outcome may not be quite what you want. So what are some other ways that we use prescribed fire? Um, I, I mentioned mastication, uh, and I'll talk more about mastication in just a minute, but when you, when you mulch a tree, you've taken the fuel load from the canopy and dropped it to the ground, and that still remains there. And, and it can be flammable and, and still, um, you know, still burn in a wildfire scenario. So one of the things we've done is go back into these mulch areas and selectively burn off uh, some of those some of that fuel load. And so it, it helps to reduce that fuel load. And as you can see up here, 
a lot of these shrubs are going to survive that scenario. So you can you can use fire in that system and still preserve the shrub component while while um, eliminating the fuel load. It's one more step on, on in the process, um, and adds one more element, one more expense. Um, so we haven't really done a whole lot of it, but it, it can also be a useful tool and a way way to use fire. Probably the most common way that we use fire in the West Desert District is doing slash pile and burn treatments. So areas where we can't get mechanical in, maybe you're dealing with steeper slopes, you can send hand crews up, cut the trees, pile them, and then we come back under winter conditions, as you see up here, and, and burn those piles. So there's far less risk with, with using fire in this manner. Um, and, and so it, it's actually you know, a, a tool that we use fairly commonly. So, what are the, re the national guidelines on prescribed burning? So, the record of decision has a statement, prescribed fire will not be used in sagebrush step. And you read that and you think, well, wait a minute. Um, is that really what we want to do? But fortunately, there's some flexibility built into these statements. The exception would be if the NEPA analysis shows that this, you know, this is really the best tool for this situation. Um, in the approved resource management plan amendment, something similar. If, if prescribed fire is used in greater sagebrush habitat, sage grouse habitat, these four elements need to be addressed. So there's kind of this emphasis, emphasis to limit the use of prescribed burning in sage, especially in priority sage grouse habitat. Um, but there's caveats built in so that we can still use it uh, if, if that's the appropriate tool. So I'm going to shift gears now and talk a little bit about mastication. This has really become our go-to treatment, especially dealing with juniper issues. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, they, they take these big, huge tractors out there with rotating drums and these gnarly teeth on them, and you can just shred the tree right on site. Um, leaves a mulch pile that you see here. And some of the benefits of mastication is that you can be very selective in the way you implement. It has very little damage to the shrub component. There's far less liability, especially rel relative to something like prescribed burning. It's easy to contract. Um, I can literally write a contract and have it out the door uh, ready to go uh, in about an hour, at least up to the, the contracting officers who put it out on the street. And the mulch provides some, some positive benefits by helping to re retain soil moisture and, and providing immediate erosion control on the soil surface. And one of the other things I'll talk about a little bit later is we've also observed good sagebrush recruitment following these mastication treatments. Some of the disadvantages is that it can be fairly expensive. We typically pay $200 to $250 an acre um, for mastication which is more than you would pay for something like a chaining. The fuel road, as I meant, the fuel load remains on the ground, and that can cause some issues. It takes much longer to imp implement than, say, prescribed fire on 1,000 acres or, or chaining of 1,000 acres. It can take several months to go tree by tree and take every one of these, and that's part, you can understand a little bit why there's more cost associated with it. And then there are limitations for topography. We typically only use mastication in areas less than 25% slopes. So it's a great tool, not the perfect tool, but it's uh, used heavily throughout the West Desert District and throughout the state. So if we look at all the treatments that we've done over the years and kind of break them down from uh, mechanical versus prescribed fire, you get, you get a feel for really where, where our focus is. Prescribed fire is an important part of what we do, but at a much, much smaller scale. So of the 116,000 acres treated, only about 7,000 of those have been done with prescribed burning. So these treatments, are they effective at meeting the objectives that I mentioned earlier, the protection and pres preservation of sagebrush habitat and restoring resiliency? Let's talk first about the protection side of things. Uh, in West Desert District, we've had 23 of our projects impacted by 44 different wildfires. Take that down a little bit further. Some of these projects listed here have multiple treatments associated with them. So there's over 70 of these treatments that have been impacted by wildfires. And some of these you can see have been impacted multiple times by fires. So what that tells us is that we are placing these uh, appropriately on the landscape and they are intercepting fire. 
So here's an example of a fire. This was the Cedar Fire in 2013 up in Box Hiller County. It was a lightning strike fire that uh, hit up on the uh, upslope on the mountain. It ran through the crowns down to the bottom. And when it hit the fuels treatment, and this is the fuels treatment, it dropped to the ground. And you can see that it just kind of smoldered around in the chips for a while. When you look at the burn severity and the indicators, you can see in the crown fire, it, it pretty well consumed the, the leaf tissue, the biomass in the trees, and that's an indicator of a fairly high severity fire. When it dropped to the ground and got to the other side, you see those that leaf tissue still intact. So the fire intensity and severity was much decreased in the fuels treatment, and they were able to then corral and, and get a handle on it. Here's another example from 2013. In, in fact, I went straight from the Cedar Fire to this fire. Um, actually, yeah, that's right. So another crown fire running in the juniper. And in this picture, you can see it running through the trees. But down here is where the fuels treatment in is. It's a mastication treatment where the, the trees have been thinned. Uh, they were able to use the treatment to put in um, retardant lines. And as the fire progressed, it dropped into the fuels treatment. It kind of smoldered through here. You can see it's just kind of smoldered out and into, the, into the retardant line. And we had much decreased um, fire behavior in those areas. And like I said, just generally smoldering around. And that really can increase the effectiveness of the suppression efforts on the ground. And um, especially when you're using tools like a bulldozer, uh, it's much more effective in bullhog chips than in standing juniper. Um, let's see. One other example from Box Elder County. This is a wildfire that was burning, uh, in, again, in, from juniper into a fuels treatment. The suppression forces are actively engaged, and their goal at this point is to keep the fire from moving through the fuels treatment and getting back into the crowns and taking out the whole side of the mountain. So at this point, they're engaged. They're, they're on a road. Um, they're trying to do some pre-wetting so that when the fire comes through, they're hoping to hold it on the road. And sorry, there's a little bit of uh, bad video in here. But what I want you to focus on is, is the fire behavior that you see in the video as it's in the juniper. So you'll see this guy coming through here. He's trying to put fire on the ground, try to do a little bit of uh, um, black lining or create some black to, to slow the fire progression. And if you could hear the audio right now, people were hollering at him, get out of there, you know? They couldn't really see what was happening back there. So he thought they were saying, <laughs> yeah, what they're saying is drag fire with you. And he thought they were saying, drop your torch. So that's why you saw him do that. Um, eventually, he comes out. And you can see the flame links and the juniper behind him. And let me also say that these suppression forces probably wouldn't be in this situation had there not been the fuels treatment here. If it was just a crown fire and juniper, it would have been a very different scenario. But you can see the winds picking up and the flame links taken off through this uh, through the crowns, and at this point, it gets really sketchy. And so the IC on the ground says, everybody out. And so that's what happens there. Everyone is pulled out, and they go down the road and reposition. And you can see in the background where the flames are going through the fuels treatment relative to um, the juniper. So there is a very significant difference in the fire behavior in the untreated areas versus the treated areas that you're looking at now. This one's only 17 seconds or so. It just kind of finishes it off. You can see the fire whirls going through. That's an indicator of extreme conditions. And again, fire on the ground. Single trees with 30-foot flame lengths. Pretty intense. So. so how did this all play out? Um, 
the fire did push through the fuel stream and up to the road, jumped the road, the wind let off, the fire uh, uh, behavior really calmed down, and um, the fire was prevented from going up slope and taking out half the mountain. So good example there. So this, I'm going to change gears now and talk about how we're meeting the restoration objectives. And so this first picture is a clover treatment that was done. This is pre-treatment back in 2005 and 6. Fairly common with very, very little understory to begin with. After the treatment, it looked like this. And this picture was taken um, just back in August. And you can see the mulch is still there, but you have a really, really strong response from the perennial understory. So the berry fire happened in er, early in August. Um, you can see the, the fire smoldering around in the chips. And the goal is to try to prevent it from going into these trees and uh, getting it, turning into a crown fire. When the fire was all finished and said and done, you know, we walked through it. And you can see some hot spots here where the chips had really burned hot. But overall, what we saw was just this smoldering kind of effect. And if, again, you look at these indicators, um, the, the leaf tissue is still on these junipers that are regrowing. Um, the grasses are still standing in most places. Even the sagebrush is intact. And so another example of how this treatment helped to modify the fire behavior. Um, bullhog chips still burn very hot. They're very smoky. If you're on the ground trying to put a fire out in bullhog chips, it can be a real challenge. But it also prevents, or provides other opportunities um, because of the way it modifies the fire behavior. So looking at the resiliency side of things. Um, on the right was a, was a bull hog treatment done in oh, 2006, 7. And on, on the left is untreated land. Uh, 2009, a fire came through all of this area and took it out. If you look up further up slope to the left, this is what it looked like after the fire. Um, where it had been pre-treated and had had a chance to recover before the fire came through, this is what it looked like two years later. So really stark contrast and an example of restoring uh, the, the habitat before the fire came through. Uh, it's the same picture I just showed you. It's what it was pre-treatment. Post-treatment, you could see the real contrast in treated versus untreated. And we also started to see a lot of sagebrush coming into these areas. Um, so we started to think, well, what's going on here? Is this just a fluke? So we went out and did some plots, um, started to notice real distinct differences in the vegetation vigor in areas that they were treated versus not treated, much more leader growth in sagebrush. I'm going to just skip through this. I've got just a few minutes. And basically what we did, we went and did some random sampling in some of our older treatment areas to determine if we could quantify or determine whether sage sagebrush was recruiting, re, recruiting naturally after these treatments. And so over, we did this at three different sites, collected this data. And what we found at all three of these sites is in the bull hog areas relative to an untreated control, we saw a major increase in, in sagebrush seedling uh, densities, it's both seedlings and juveniles. And so that was kind of neat to, to find that and realize that some, there's something about these treatments that's helping to stimulate sage, natural sagebrush recruitment. Whether that's uh, tied to an episodic event um, with climate, we're not really sure. But there really did seem to be a, a distinct link to disturbance in those areas. So in summary, um, the emphasis on greater sage grouse management and, and sagebrush management nationally doesn't necessarily change the way we're doing things on the ground, but it does provide clearer direction about what the desired outcomes will be. And it helps us to prioritize how we do things. For us, mechanical treatments are still going to be the treatment of choice, um, although prescribed tool or prescribed fire will be um, a tool that we use on a smaller, smaller scale and in areas that we're not maybe working directly in sage grouse habitat. We do know that from our experience, these treatments are pretty effective at doing what we say they do, at uh, reducing fire size and severity, 
um, dealing with the issues of conifer encroachment and re restoring and at least increasing that ecosystem resiliency. And finally, our, some of our observations indicate that these treatments can be good to help stimulate uh, natural sagebrush recovery. So with that, I think I'm just about out of time. Ron, do we have any time for questions? Okay, time for questions. So, questions for Brad? Rick. Brad, I know the hot spots where you had the mulch piles. Uh, did those spots come in and cheat? You know, it, 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 so the question was, did those hot spots where we where the chips have burned, where there may have been deep piles of chips when they burned hot, do they come back to cheek grouse? And in some instances, yes, they do. So in that berry fire, we expect to see some cheek grass increase out there, but because the perennial understory is so strong, um, the, the bear team, or the emergency stabilization or re response team went out to this fire, walked it, looked at the burn indicators, et cetera, and determined that we didn't need to reseed it, that it was gonna come back on its own, so. But we do expect to see some increase in these areas of cheat grass. So. Um, how can yeah, can you please repeat the question? Like the, the areas that treated, like these um, cheat grass, um, so, so, right. I think the question, if I heard it right, was um, how does it compare in areas where um, fire burned through the crowns of a juniper versus versus through the bullhog chips? Is there more of an increase in the juniper versus the chips? Is that the question? Right. So, so what our experience has been is in those areas where the treatment has had two to three years minimum recovery, for that, when it has that time for the understory to respond, um, then we do see a decrease in cheek grass in a post-fire scenario relative to an area where, where the fire burned hot through the crowns of the juniper. So these photos that I've showed up here, um, are, I'm not sure honestly on, on some of the grazing timing related to these photos, but it, it's a good question about grazing management in relation to these treatments. And Allison, let me answer it this way. Because of the scale at which we're operating and we're going to continue to operate over the next who knows how many years, um, grazing management is going, going to be a critical component of the success of these treatments. So we've already been to our partners in uh, like Box Elder and Rich County and had these kinds of discussions. We'll continue to have these discussions to, to figure out how we can do effectively do grazing management to give these treatments the rest they need in order to be successful. So it's definitely something that is a very important part of, of the of the discussion and of the success of all these treatments. Does that answer your question, Allison? Sure. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll have to cut it off there. You got a quick one? What precipitation zones are these treatments found in? Typically, we are a minimum of 10, oh, okay. um, but up, up to 12 to 14. Okay, thanks a lot, Brian. Sure.